Quantum of Solace. Quantum of Solace. Oh, I have so much to say. So they, <laughs> they, they quickly wanted to rush out a sequel to Casino Royale. It was so well received. It made, up to that point, it was the biggest money maker. I think bigger than Goldeneye. Bigger than Goldeneye, yeah. yeah. And so they want to quickly rush out. They want to make it, get it done in like two years. You know, they want to stick to that, you know, every two years we're doing a new Bond film kind of thing. Unfortunately, a couple things happened. You had issues going on uh, with MGM. Which is one of the studios that like backs uh, the making of the Bond films, and you had a writer strike. Now the conditions under which Casino Royale was produced are eerily similar to the conditions that happened to a film called License to Kill, which was Timothy Dalton's <laughs> last Bond film as well, where budgets were seriously slashed. There was also a writer strike. A script was sort of written as they were shooting the whole nine yards, and. And I think that the, the, I, I always bring up License to Kill when we bring up Quantum Solace because there's so many similarities. I mean, both are set in Central America, you know. They both have a sort of Bond becomes rogue kind of plot. You know, they, they're, they're both, they both had the same production issues. It's, they're, they're interesting comparisons. And I've already said this many times, License Kill is my least favorite Bond film. I think there's a lot of problems with it. I think they try to do things that just don't work. They didn't have the talent in place. Quantum of Solace is also discussed as one of the worst Bond films in the canon. So it's really sad that they went from Casino Royale to Quantum of Solace, really deflated you know, the fans, you know, because it was, it was, it was a, it was a letdown. It was a serious letdown. The film is basically an epilogue to Casino Royale. It's the first Bond film that's a direct continuation of the film prior. Uh, and it's a mess. It's a mess. Do I think it's the worst Bond film in the series? I'm not sure. Although, having revisited it recently, I'm, I'm less willing to defend it than I was before. Okay. Because mm -hmm. now I'm really seeing the problems with that film. However, I, I think there's things about it that I do admire. There are things about it that I saw they're trying to do. I, I get Mark Forrester, the first non-Commonwealth director <laughs> to direct a Bond film. He was trying to make an art film. That's what he was basically trying to do. You see him trying to do all these artsy-fartsy Nicholas I, Rogue style camera shots and dissolves and stuff yeah. like that. But it's so overdone. And there's, scene, and there's scenes where the action scenes where it's just so hard to figure out what's going on. The editing's it's, so choppy. The, edit is, it, the editing's incomprehensible at times. And there's no impact. No. Because like for me, like the best Bond action scenes are like little stories in themselves. There's like an arc. There's a beginning, middle, end to the stories. And there's like usually a coda that sometimes acts as a punchline, sometimes doesn't. But it acts as sort of like a nice period to the sentence. And in, in uh, Quantum of Solace, it's just like, it, there's, there, it's so incomprehensible to figure out what's going on, how it's visually mapped out, that when it reaches what should be a coda, you're like, okay, I don't understand what happened there. Okay. Well, this is the first James Bond movie I ever saw in the theater, first off. Interesting. I saw it actually twice. And the first time with my cousin who dragged me to go see it, and the second time my mother wanted to see it. So I went to see it. Uh, my problem with this film is... It feels like a transport. It could almost be a transporter yeah. movie. It feels yeah. like a typical action film where there doesn't feel like there's any real stakes. Because, like, okay, if you just look at Daniel Craig throughout the film, he never breaks a sweat. It's like it's sort of like a recent movie like Denzel Washington and the Equalizer. I couldn't get into the film because he barely breaks a sweat going up against all these villains and all. And all these villains. What? Vill there's only one villain. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying. But basically, in throughout all the action sequences. With um, uh, Daniel Craig, he never breaks his sweat. He never looks worried. He just walks into a hotel, knows exactly how to do ha get this hotel room, this reservation, exactly how to get this information on this character, exactly who to follow, and it's just like there's no work being put in, and there's no effort. So it so like how we were talking about how it made him a complex character in Casino Royale. Here he feels it feels like it's just the James Bond we've seen in the previous series. It just feels like there's nothing to it. He's going through the motions, but there's nothing really that personal. Then, you know, they throw, and now they finally start throwing the women at him. You know, you have uh, Gemma 
at, Jim at, Atherton. Yeah, yeah, and like really Strawberry in, Fields. Yeah, she's barely in the film. She's in there for a few scenes, and then you know, they bond, but then you know she gets killed, and it's just like, oh okay. <laughs> yeah, the film has a lot like elements that are just seem badly timed, like the rhythm's off a lot. Although I will say, in defense of Daniel Craig, I, you, I, I, I start to see him as Bond more in Quantum Solace, where I'm like, okay, I can see him becoming the Connery-style Bond. Because okay. he has, he's starting to have those elements that we, that's been lost. I mean, you know, you had it a little bit in Lazenby. Lazenby used to get a bad rap, but he's actually not that bad at Casino Royale. But since then, Bond had been seriously like, I don't want to say more effeminate, but turned more effeminate, like like kind of a little softer, you know, and whatever. Uh, you lost a sort of ruggedness, that sort of swagger. And you see a lot of that in, 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 in Daniel Craig and in Quantum of Solace. I agree with you, there's not that much complexity there, but I do see Craig trying really hard to bring that to the film. It's just that the script isn't there to support that, unfortunately. And I also felt that the villain wasn't that strong either. Yeah, yeah and, and he's such a good actor. Exactly, but it was just You know, like... he's such a good actor. I, they should have done something more with that. I liked, the elements I liked about the film, I liked how it was a gray world. You know, I liked how, this is why I like it better than License to Kill. License to Kill, everybody's so one-dimensional. <laughs> you know, so one-dimensional. Uh, whereas in, in, in um, license, whereas in, in Quantum of Solace, you have these elements, like I love the whole thing. Like like Felix Leiter, CIA agent, and, and the other guy, mm -hmm. you know. In previous Bond films, you know that character be like like a JJ. You know, what's his name? Uh, the JJ Pepper sheriff type oh. character, right? <laughs> Just really obnoxious <laughs> and blah blah blah. And, you know. Whereas in this one, it's more grounded. You know, it's it's more. It comes across as a little more realistic and interesting. Um, well, I did like the opening sequence. That's really the only noteworthy thing. I I thought the opening sequence was. Just so, like the way it was edited, I just, there's like one sequence I like, one set piece I really like in the film, and that's the opera sequence. Okay. I love and that's where like he's trying to be arty and all that stuff, and it works. But it's weird, like the whole thing, like like he, he puts on someone else's tuxedo and it fits perfectly, and then uh, he breaks the the thing off, the handle off the door. Like how, how strong is he? <laughs> right? That was weird to me. Um, I, I liked the moment before they invade the hotel at the end where he's with the woman and he gives her the little speech on, have you ever killed anyone before? Mm -hmm. And explain, and just in a very cold, methodical way, just explains to her, this is what you need to do and expect. And I thought that's a nice written moment. It's actually one of my favorite written moments in a, in a Bond film. Okay. Um, but yeah, the hotel's a weird place to have a climax. Uh, and, and Matthew Almerich, I mean, his character is so underwritten. There's nothing interesting about it. There's nothing interesting about it. He comes about across him. as a twerp more than anything. Yeah. yeah, really. I'm with Jeff. I mean, the, the villains aren't memorable. The women were a lot weaker. And it was just poorly edited, in my opinion. And I remember there was a whole controversy with Jim Atherton's character getting the, the Goldfinger homage. Mm -hmm. Instead of her being paid in gold, she's like slattered with oil. And I know people were flipping out about that. I didn't mind that, actually, that aspect of it. didn't bother me. Yeah, but it was just like the, at the time because of the war in Iraq and right. fighting over the oil. So that's where sort of the political aspect of it started to come in and people were like, ooh, you know. I, I think know. that they could have better justified, they could have figured out a, a psychological way to justify why Craig was willing to go into bed with her, that maybe that's his drug or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, to deal with his pain and allow people to be critical of that. You know, why not? You, you, you're going complex. So why not go all the way? But it's like there was no real. They didn't. They didn't show any like consequences or implications of that. And she barely made an impression before she, you know, got mm -hmm. offed. You know. I blame the writer strike on that. Yeah. Well, it's I that's the problem. That. Every time there's a writer strike, it usually it's left in the hands of Michael Wilson, one of the producers, to write the script. Mm -hmm. And script. Oh, I forgot to mention something. Casino Royale. Although the initial draft was written by Wade um, and Purvis. Uh, what's his name? Paul Haggis. Paul Haggis of Crash fame, not Cronenberg's Crash, <laughs> came in and did a rewrite, and apparently that's what elevated the script and made the film. Haggis also came in and did, apparently was supposed to do a rewrite of Quantum Solace, and then a screenwriter strike hit. Oh, okay. Right? So, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's interviews with, with Forrester, 
going on about how he wanted to tackle the elements of fire, water, air, you know, all that stuff, and how each action set piece was going to represent that. And I'm like, what's with this hippie shit? Oh you know, what's what I have to do with Bond? <laughs> this is why they stuck with John Glenn for so many years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, you know, and I admire, I, 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 I I admire what he wanted to do. He, you know, I admire the approach. They want to do something more than just a standard Bond look, but it just, it just didn't, it didn't work out. I will say this. Um, I will say that, and this is going to sound very gay of me. I don't care. <laughs> that I think Craig looked great in the part, in terms okay. of like the, 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 co you know, the, the wardrobe choices and stuff like that. Uh, more tailored look and all that stuff. That's sort of interviewed. To Tom, that's where he started to introduce the Tom Ford look okay. in Quantum Solace because the idea is now he's becoming more sophisticated. Uh, for the very first time, because I never felt this in the other one. Yeah, we all wanted to be Bond. We all fantasize. <laughs> but I never looked at Bond and said, oh, I want to wear the suit he's wearing. I want to wear the tuxedo he's wearing. Well, now I'm watching Craig. I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to buy that suit. Yeah. That suit looks awesome. It's also the first time we see Bond wear jeans. Mm -hmm. A little bit of trivia. No, seriously, look back in all the other Bond films. They refuse to give Bond the closest. Well, in Connery era, they allowed him to wear shorts, you know, and you know, and a T-shirt a little bit, depending upon, you know, like in Thunderball. Um, but the, the Roger Moore era, it was always like slacks. Slacks. And always jeans. slacks. And it remains <laughs> slacks throughout the entire yeah. series. And then Craig comes on. It's like, it's okay to wear a T-shirt. It's okay to wear jeans. It makes sense. And in fact, in the books, Bond is described as sometimes going on missions wearing black jeans. Uh, when he has to like do his like ninja, you know, secret stuff, right? <laughs> so, anyways, uh, so Quantum of Solace, yeah, it was a disappointment, yep. big disappointment after yeah. Casino Royale. So it looked like after Casino uh, Quantum of Solace, there was like the 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 the, the, the issues with MGM weren't being resolved. There was rumors that they were going to discontinue the series, that Craig wasn't going to get his third Bond. So three years later, we got a third Bond. We had a much longer break between Bond films, and we're usually accustomed to. That film became Skyfall. Uh, prior to Sky, Skyfall going into production, it was announced that they had gone to Sam Mendes, the Oscar-winning director, director of Road to Perdition, which also <laughs> starred Daniel Craig. Uh, and they went to him to be an advisor on the film. Like, could you advise on this film? And everyone was like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> they had an initial draft by Purvis Wade, as they usually do, but they had, uh, is, it, is it John John Logan, John Logan yeah. the writer of Gladiator, uh, Hugo, among others, was brought in to, to flesh it out. And the result was Skyfall. Skyfall is an interesting <laughs> introduction, part of the canon. It's It's... I guess the best way to describe it, it's a meta film. Meta, it's almost a meta Bond film, but not in the way that, say, Die Another Day tried to be, by <laughs> introducing like all these visual homages to everything, right? Because there are some references, because it was an anniversary of Bond, mm -hmm. right? At the, was it the 50th anniversary? 50th anniversary. The 50th anniversary of Bond. They didn't hit you over the head with these like references. If there were, if there were like little homages to like past films, they were part of the plot. They're there as, as to help move the plot forward. So they were there for a reason. What was it, why, the reason why I, think, I call this a meta Bond film in that it subverts a lot of things that we usually expect from a Bond movie, right? Mm -hmm. Climax, at the villain's lair, none of this film. It, the climax is now on Bond's home turf, literally on his home turf. This is the first fu a film that addresses his childhood upbringing. It could be argued that M is the Bond girl. Yes. You know, a lot of like weird things, you know, like interesting things. Well, it turned out that Sam Mendes decided to direct it after all. Uh, not only that, it was interesting how the casting was coming together on this one because it's like, okay, you got Sam Mendes directing this. Now he hasn't had like a huge hit recently, but he's a critically acclaimed director. Not so not a go-to guy for James Bond films. Okay. Then you find out, oh, they cast Ray Fiennes. Wait, they cast Albert Finney? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, Javier Bardem is going to play the villain? I mean, it's, so everyone's like, what is going on? With, You're going for an Oscar. <laughs> it's like, 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 okay. Roger Deakins is doing the cinematography? It seemed like you got the sense, 
yes, Quantum Solace sucked. <laughs> but you're getting the sense that now Eon has been somehow, they feel a little empowered, a little more confident with taking Bond in a direction where they can say, okay, now we, don't, we can mess with the formula a lot. It seems like people like Casino Royale enough, <laughs> so much so that they're willing to forgive Quantum <laughs> Solace. Let's go for it, Brooke. Let's say if we can't, let's try to make an Oscar-deserving James <laughs> Bond film. You know what I mean? And that could have been a total train wreck and attempting to do something like that. However, Skyfall, what did you think? Um, well, anything at that point would have probably beaten Quantum of Solace, <laughs> uh, considering. Yeah, right. Um, but, I mean, I really found myself engaged because... I found it, even though Casino Royale was dark, and this was even darker, if that was at all possible. Um, it has a richness, considering I haven't seen that many Bonds films. This, to me, seemed more rich than any of the other ones. Um, I mean, if you really look at it in a certain way, first of all, it also has the hottest Bond girl, even though I love Eva Green. I don't remember the woman's name, but in this film, even though she doesn't last long, oh my God. Um, but anyway, um, Javier Bardem... You know, I'm not really the biggest fan of Javier Bardem, but I will say he at least seemed like he was having fun with the role. Because at first he seems like the typical maniacal villain where it's like, ooh, ah, ah. And then finally, as his, I guess, you find out the reason for the things he's doing, and then it becomes a little more grounded for him, even though he still stays a little wacky throughout, but you see more of the personal factor. The only, I mean, I can nitpick like you and be like, okay, for his plan to work, every <laughs> everything would have to be set up perfectly. Or That's my know. one problem with the film, actually. And so, yeah. yeah, I can see it as that. But I guess if you're just going along with it, I like how it uh, it acknowledges things like he, like, well, spoiler alert, like we find out early he might not be fit to be in the field anymore and find out, in fact, he wasn't supposed to be in the field because M lied for him so he could go back out there. And... In the beginning, even though it's like really thin, there's that whole thing that maybe he doesn't want to come back. Maybe he wants to stay thought of as dead, but then he comes back kind of begrudgingly. Yeah, I mean, Sean Connery had Goldfinger, Roger Moore had The Spider Love Me. This was the film that made me accept Daniel Craig as James Bond because it still was in the direction of Casino Royale, still evolving the character, but you also started to bring back a little bit of the fun of the earlier films, the scene with the Komodo Dragon, bringing in Q, but like you said, trying to subvert everything in ways you wouldn't expect. So you bring in Q, you're thinking he's gonna get gadgets again, you only give him a gun and a radio, and they <laughs> do it so cleverly. And um, the ending scene, you're not having to use gadgets other than the Aston Martin. Everything is like light bulbs used for bombs and shotguns and knives. Like, they keep it very grounded, but still the action is heightened, you have an old school Bond villain done in a very modern way with Javier Bardeen. And yeah, I mean, you don't have a Bond girl per se, but you have Naomi Harris playing, you know, the character that we know becomes Money Penny. So you have like a little bit of transition that all goes back to the Connery Bond era. Well, this is this is the thing. Um, I was talking about how they, it's, it, it's, it's a weird film to explain to people. On one hand, it's a classic Bond film. On the other hand, it's a subversive, it's a really, really, really subversive take on James Bond. Again, M is the Bond girl. Uh, she's also the mother figure, which is really interesting. And, and, and this is where James, it's, it's a James Bond film that gets pretty warped at times, if you think about it. However, it's very Fleming. Fleming loved to like introduce these really perverse, twisted themes with some of his characters that never quite made it into the films. And here, this is where I was like, well, this feels like an Ian Fleming novel come to life on film. Because that whole element, the rivalry, you know, the whole idea that, that Javier Bardem could have been, or, or, or Bond could have gone in the direction of Javier Bardem, they, he, Bond could have easily become that character. Mm -hmm. um, I like that element. I've been waiting to see a villain come up, uh, that could be a doppelganger to Bond in the way that Bond could be that person. Not only that, but Bond isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily dislike the villain. If he has to go after him, that's just because it's his job or he has to protect somebody. You never get that sense that they hate each other, right? You get the sense that, he, that eventually Bardem's character, Silva, eventually gets like so frustrated with Bond. He's just like out of frustration, he wants him out of the way. But you get the sense that they're playing this game and, and Silva likes playing with him and genuinely likes him, you know, kind of thing. Especially with that phenomenal introductory sequence, oh, yeah. <laughs> which is... Uh, 
th this is, I think it's the best directed Bond in the entire canon. Mendes does an exceptional job, even with the action scenes. They're not just well thought out. The geography is fascinating of how these, these things play out. They're imaginative. They're incredibly well choreographed. Roger, I, I, I credit, for me, yeah. I credit Roger Deakins and Mendes equally. They really collaborated together. It's, you feel the collaboration. That sequence of Bond is in that tower in Shanghai when he confronts the assassin. Mm -hmm. That whole scene where the camera slowly dollies in, it's all in one take, and they're just in silhouette going after each other. And, and in one take, it finishes with you know the camera going down, Bond's holding onto the guy as he hung off the, off the ledge. That is stunning. It's stunning, it's exciting. There's no, it's not so stunning that distracts from being involved in what's going on in that scene. It's just, everything is just pitch perfect and how that's, that it's directed and shot. Um, I have problems with the plotting of the film. Okay. It doesn't, why, it, like, like when you think about it, it's like how the hell did, did it really have to be that complicated where Silva had to get himself caught, you know, all this stuff. It just, it, like how did he anticipate that Bond would follow him to that one tunnel and then he would, like had an explosive set up to, you know, if you think about it too hard, the film really <laughs> falls apart for you. It's folks. Going to Brosnan. And that is a that is the big flaw for the film. That's why I, I personally think Casino Royale is the better movie. Okay. Okay. However, ironically, I th even though I think it's plotted in a really weird way, I think it's script the scripting in terms of dialogue is some of the best in the series. Some of the most memorable dialogue, like rich, wonderful dialogue, and not the cheesy kind of James Bond one liners we've expected from like the Bond, you know, the Moore series. Mm -hmm. That whole speech delivered by Silva, you know, when he arrives off the elevator and slowly approaches Bond is brilliant and it's captivating. And I love the direction that whole conversation goes, you know, especially the famous you know, the moment that everyone talks about where clearly Silva is seducing him. <laughs> and, and he makes that comment to Bond's like, I bet you your MI6 training didn't prepare you for this. And, and Bond says, what makes you think it hasn't? You know, kind of like comment, like the implication, ooh, well, Bond is bio, is that what you're saying, you know, that kind of thing. And it's a brilliant way to like, subvert expectations to how he would respond to that situation. Um, I like the scene when he's doing the testing of, in, underneath MI6 and they give him like, was the relentless test or whatever you call it, and they give him the word association thing. I thought that was really cool. That was really done. In fact, it, it, they started to, with the bras in there, after go, like, even like during GoldenEye, uh, they started doing this thing where, okay, we can't, there's, we've run out of titles to adapt except for Casino Royale, which wasn't available. Quantum of Solace was a title from a short story. Um, however, what they started to do is they started, take, they started to revisit the novels, taking elements from the novels that didn't make it to the films, and started to sort of co-op those. I mean, like Go, uh, uh, GoldenEye, that whole plot between him and um, his buddy, I want to say, is it 006 or 009? 006, Trevelyan. Trevelyan, right? Uh, that was lifted directly out of the novel Moonraker. That's the plot of Moonraker, the novel. Okay, there's no outer space yet. <laughs> right? It's a guy who's been posing as a British patriot, wealthy guy, um, who turns out to have been an ex-Nazi, whose fellow comrades were imprisoned in POW camp in Britain and were tortured, and and and, and he he swore revenge on Britain for that. And it's assumed he has like a rocket that's a bomb that he's going to like detonate in London you know, as revenge for this whole thing. The exact same thing. Um, what they did with a Skyfall is that they took the elements from the end of You Only Live Twice and the beginning of The Man with the Golden Gun, where at the end of You Only Live Twice, a novel, uh, whatever happens at the climax of You Only Live Twice, Bond winds up having amnesia for a while during this whole period where he disappears and everyone thinks he's dead, okay. right? And then he stays dead for a while. And then eventually he returns back to MI6 for Man with the Golden Gun. Um, and he has to go through a whole reprogramming process because he's also been brainwashed by the KGB, the mm -hmm. whole thing. So they took that element, the fact that Bond is presumed dead, and then he has to return. And he has to go through this whole retraining and physical you know, therapy thing and all that, so, and, and mental therapy. Having said that, uh, in the film Skyfall, they took a lot of elements from that. And they took elements from Moonraker because Moonraker in a novel, the entire novel takes place in England. I love how the film feels like an ensemble film. Yeah. yeah, I feel yeah. like 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 for the first time, every not just the villain or James Bond, but everyone else is fully fleshed out. The Komodo dragon should not have worked. 
It should not have worked at all, and yet somehow, it, 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 okay, they talk about two different kinds of James Bond films. There's the down and dirty, you know, the gritty ones, the ones that are more like adventure thrillers, and then you have what you call the OTT Bonds, the over-the-top Bonds, like this, you know, uh, Moonraker, Moonraker. Moonraker. Uh, You Only Live Twice, you know, the, the, the Goldfinger was the one that started that, that kind of whole trend. This is the closest thing we'll get to a Daniel Craig over-the-top Bond film. You know, they figure out a way to do that while keeping it firmly grounded in a Daniel Craig Bond universe. And I thought they did a really good job with that. Um, I was prepared I, when, when the whole thing at the end, where it turns out, you know, Eve is actually Eve Money Penny, you know, that could have been dangerously like Dark Knight Rises, the Robin <laughs> moment. <laughs> oh, right? Geez. But somehow it worked. But this is what I loved about the ending because you haven't seen it. Mike Foltz, our, our, com our uh, colleague, is probably the only one in the universe that hasn't seen Skyfall yet, so he's not going to watch yeah, it. Yeah, turn it off, Mike. What I loved about this film is that it not only was it a return, it ends with a return to the beginning, but visually, it's the office, it's M's office from the 1960s and 70s, right? Ray Fiennes is the new M. That's pretty cool. And I think it's pretty amazing that that Fines has agreed to commit to this. He's a good actor. He Why looks not? like Bernard Lee a little bit. Well, I, I, one time I thought he'd make a good Bond. I love how they gave him a backstory. I love how they developed his character throughout the thing. You thought he was going to be the stuffy bureaucrat. Mm -hmm. And then as, as you get to know him more, he found, no, this guy has an interesting history. And he's more on their side than he's initially letting on. I liked how Ben Wishaw is a younger Q. It makes sense. They kind of made him like a Mark Zuckerberg type, which I thought was cool. Yeah, and another subversion. Older Bond, younger Q. I, th I think Skyfall is incredibly enjoyable. I think uh, it does have issues plotting-wise. However, I think its pluses far outweigh the minuses. Sure. That's how I feel about Skyfall. I would put it up there in, as you know, the top 10 Bond films. I, do I think it's better at Casino Royale? No. But I still think it's really, really good for a lot of like good reasons. It has one of the best theme songs in the series. Yeah, yeah it has. A, you know what? I'm, I'm getting sick of these <laughs> theme songs that have to, yeah, sound like a James Bond song. You know, I, I like the song. It's mm. it was better than Quantum of Solace. Qu Everything is better than Quantum of Solace at this point. And I I don't know why they they did a, they're not doing. See, I love. See, we haven't even gotten into like the title sequences, like the title sequence designs and all that stuff, like the Casino War. Royale title sequence, I love. Yeah, I love how it was two, almost two dimensional animation. I wish they did more of that. I'm disappointed they haven't gone back to that. Because I like that. It's kind of like, what was it, that, that sort of uh, uh, Saul Bass mm -hmm. kind of like almost retro feel to it. And I think they changed the um, visual effects companies between. No, the they only did it once. They did that, uh, the one who did it for Quantum Solace, that was Forster's choice. And oh, then they okay. went back to the guy who designed it, uh, who had been designing it from the Brazen era up to Casino Royale. Let's do some speculation on Spectre. Uh, See what I did there? <laughs> See what I did? I know. Okay. Thing. Spectre, um, we know, well look, Spectre. Sp do you guys know what Spectre stands for? What the acronym is for Spectre? I forget. Special I Executor Terrorism, revenge, and extortion. Oh, jeez. I think that's what it stands for. Yeah, I know. Yeah, relax. It's like, it's like <laughs> quantum of solace, anyone? It's All right. <laughs> so, so, I mean, and they're, 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 do we think that, that Christoph Waltz is going to turn out to be Blofeld? Yes. Yeah. But not the Blofeld that we know with the bald head and the cat. I don't think. <laughs> Which was not the Blofeld of the novels either. I'd be, I'd be, I think what they're going to do is they're going to do what they've been doing, where things are like, it's kind of, it's like I look at the Craig universe now. Mm -hmm. It's like an alternate universe to the, like the prior bonds before. It's sort of the same thing, but it's, it's skewed. It's alternate reality take on what we've seen before. And I think that this Spectre is going to be sort of like an alternate reality take on the Spectres we've seen before. Because uh, I don't know, I, I always, like, like in my dream, like if I ever made a James Bond film and no. reintroduced Spectre, I always thought that Spectre would be a great sort of military contractor kind of company, you know, a la, you know, you know so, something that we see like in Afghanistan right now. Okay. Uh, and, that, and that, because like the character Blofeld in the books, he was, uh, you know, a, a, a resistance fighter during World War II, but he was also a war profiteer. So he was this complex character. He was a decorated war veteran, but he was also a war profiteer. 
and it'd be interesting to update that character and say like the Bosnian War scenario or something yeah. like that, you know. Maybe Quantum is Spectra in its early stages. And it's all Chris Nolan mind blown. <laughs> Boom! Chris <laughs> Nolan, mind blown. And Michael Caine will make an appearance for no reason. <laughs> well, Sam Mendes has returned, although Roger Deakins is not doing the cinematography in so, this one. Mm. So that would be, he will be sadly missed. Anyway, so any further thoughts? No? Yes? I say, a good bond. I say I give Christopher Walken another chance as a villain in the future. All right. <laughs> Check us out on Facebook. We also have a Facebook page. Please like us. We've started a podcast. Go to iTunes. Uh, well, first off, go to This Is Infamous. Check out podcast there. Click on the link to iTunes and rate us. Comment on us, please. We really appreciate the support. You want to yes. be supportive of us, please do that. That really helps a great deal. When you we uh, upload a new episode and we put out the links on the social networks, please share with your friends. Uh, check us out on Twitter. And we each have individual Twitter accounts too. So, you know, uh, follow us, what have you. But anyways... Thus ends our discussion of the Daniel Craig era of Bond, and maybe we'll do like a capsule review of uh, Spectre when that comes out. Who knows? And hopefully Mark Folks will join us by then, provided he'd seen the movie. <laughs> so anyways, this is uh, this episode of uh, Cinephiles signing off. Goodbye.